Act 4. Scene 1. Scene. Beside the statue of Adam and Eve in the Luxembourg Gardens late afternoon the following day. The wind is blowing in the trees and stirring leaves, straws, and bits of paper on the ground. Maurice and Henrietta are seated on a bench. Henrietta. You don't want to die? No, I daren't. I imagine myself freezing in the grave with only a sheet over me and a few shavings underneath. Besides, it seems to me that I still have something left undone. Although I don't know what it is. I can guess what it is. Tell me. It is revenge. You, like me, suspected Jean and Emile of having set those detectives on me yesterday. Only a woman could think up such a revenge on arrival. Those were my thoughts. But you know my suspicions go even further. It's as if these last days of suffering have sharpened my wits. For instance, can you explain why the waiter at the Alberga des Autres and the head waiter at the pavilion were not called to give evidence at the hearing? I hadn't thought about it before, but yes, uh, I do know why. They had no evidence to give, because they had not listened to our conversation at all. And how did the commissaire know what we said? He didn't know, but he figured it out. He guessed and guessed right. Perhaps he has seen a similar case before. Or else he knew from our looks what we had said. There certainly are people who can read the thoughts of others. He found it quite natural that we should call Adolf, as he was the dupe, the ass. That appears to be the rule, with the slight exception that he is generally called the idiot. But as there was talk of a chariot, a triumphal chariot, ass came more readily to mind. It's simple to find the fourth factor when you know three. To think we let ourselves be so completely taken in. That's due to thinking well of people. That's what one gets for it. But I may tell you that behind this commissaire, who, by the way, must be an unmitigated scoundrel, I suspect there is another. You mean the abbe, who is playing the part of private detective? That's who I mean. That man has to hear so many confessions. And don't forget this. Adolf told me himself that he had been in St. Germain that morning. What did he do there? Told the tale, of course, and bewailed his fate. And then the abbe added two and two together for the commissaire. Henrietta, tell me something. Do you trust Adolf? I don't trust any human beings any longer. Not even Adolf. Him least of all. How can I trust an enemy, a man whose mistress I stole? Well, as you said at first, I will give you a few details about our friend. You know he refused that award from London. Can you think of any reason? No. Well, he considers himself unworthy of it, and he has taken a penitential vow not to receive any distinctions. Is that possible? Why, what has he done? He has committed a crime which is not punishable by law. That's what he told me. In an indirect way. He too. He, the best, the most perfect of men who never speaks ill of anyone and forgives everything. Yes. So you see, we are no worse than others. Although we are hunted as if by devils night and day. He too. Then human nature has not been slandered. But if he was capable of one crime... And one may expect anything of him. Perhaps it was he who set the police on you yesterday. Now that I come to think of it, it was he who sneaked away from us. When he saw us in the newspaper and he was lying when he insisted those fellows weren't police. One may expect anything of a lover who has been deceived. Would he be so low? No. It's impossible. Impossible. Why? What did you talk about yesterday before I came? He spoke nothing but good of you. You're lying. Henrietta, collecting herself and changing her tone. Listen, there's still one person you haven't suspected at all, and I don't know why. Have you considered Madame Catherine's changing attitude about this? In the end, didn't she say right out that she believed you capable of anything? Yes, she certainly did say that. And that shows what kind of a person she is. Because to think so ill of another without good reason... You must be a complete scoundrel yourself. Henrietta stares at him. Silence. 
to think so ill of another. You must be a complete scoundrel yourself. What do you mean? What I said. Do you mean that I? Yes. That's what I do mean now. Listen. Did you meet anyone but Marion on your visit that morning? Why do you ask? Why do you think? Well, as you appear to know it, yes, I met Jean too. Then why did you lie to me? I wanted to spare you. And now you want me to believe someone who has lied to me? No. My dear, now I believe that you have committed that murder. Wait a minute. Now we have reached the point where my thoughts have been heading, but which I resisted for as long as possible. It is remarkable how the things that lies nearest is the last thing one sees. And what one does not want to believe, one does not believe. Tell me something. Where did you go yesterday morning? After we parted in the bois? Why? You either were at Adolf's, which you couldn't have been because he had given you a lesson, or you went to... Marion. Now I am convinced that you are the murderer. And I that you are the murderess. Because you alone had an interest in the child being out of the way. The stone upsetting the carriage as you so aptly put it. That was your expression. And the one who had the interest committed the crime. Maurice. We have been running round and round this treadmill, scourging one another. Let us stop now or else we should go quite mad. You are that already. Don't you think it's time for us to part before we drive one another insane? Yes. I do think so. Henrietta, rising. Then goodbye. Two men in civilian clothes appear in the background. Henrietta turns back to Maurice. There they are again. The dark angels who will drive us from the garden and force us upon each other as if we were welded together or as if we were condemned to a long-life marriage. Should we, in fact, marry, share the same house and be able to shut the door on the world and perhaps in the end find peace? Shut ourselves in to torture one another to death? Lock ourselves in, each with his ghost as marriage portion? You tormenting me with Adolf's memory and I tormenting you with Jean's? And Marion's? Never mention Marion's name again! You know that she is being buried today. Perhaps at this very moment. And you are not there. What does that mean? It means that both the Jean and the police have warned me of the crowd's fury. Coward too. All the vices. How could you care for me? Because two days ago you were a different person. Worthy of being loved. And now sunk to such depths. Not that. But you are beginning to flaunt bad qualities which are not your own. But yours. Perhaps. For when you appear worse, I at once feel rather better. It's like going about passing on a certain kind of disease. And you've become coarse, too. I notice that myself. I don't recognize myself since that night in Gao. I put in one person and let out another. Through that gate that separates us from society. You know, now I feel I am the enemy of mankind. I should like to set fire to the earth and dry up the sea, for nothing less than a world conflagration can wipe out my dishonor. Henrietta, I had a letter from my mother today. My mother is the widow of a major and has high-minded, old-fashioned ideas about honor and all that. Would you care to read the letter? No, you wouldn't. Do you realize I am an outcast? My respectable acquaintances won't have anything to do with me. And if I go about alone, the police will take me up. Do you understand now that we must marry? We hate each other. And yet we must marry. <laughs> that is hell itself. <laughs> but Henrietta, before we join our destinies, you must tell me your secret, so that we are more evenly matched. Very well, I will tell you. I had a friend who got in trouble. You understand me? I wanted to help her, for her future was at stake. And as I was unskilled, she died. That was a rash thing to do, but it was rather noble. So you say now. But next time you are angry, you will reproach me with it. No, I wouldn't do that. But I cannot deny that this shakes my confidence. 
I'm afraid to be with you. Tell me, is her lover still alive and does he know you were responsible? He was just as guilty. And suppose his conscience were to awake. That often does happen, and he felt obligated to denounce you. Then you would be lost. I know that very well. And it is this constant dread which drives me to live so fast and furiously, so as not to have time to wake to full consciousness. And now you want me to take my marriage portion of your dread? <laughs> that is asking too much. Henrietta, but since I have shared the dishonor of Maurice, the murderer, let's put an end to- No, this is not the end yet, and I shall not loose my hold until I have seen right through you. For you shan't go round thinking yourself better than I am. You want to fight me, do you? Very well, you shall, for life and death. A roll of drums in the distance. The garden is to be closed. <sighs> Cursed is the ground for thy sake. Thorns also and thistle shall it bring forth to thee. The park keeper in uniform approaches. Keeper, courteously. Monsieur, madame, a garden must be closed. Scene 2. Scene. The Cremerie. The same evening. Madame Catherine at the counter, making entries in a book. Adolf and Henrietta at a table. Adolf, calmly, kindly. But for the hundredth time I swear that I did not sneak away. But on the contrary, I thought that you had given me the slip. That ought to convince you. Henrietta. But why did you fool me by saying they weren't police? I didn't think they were myself. And I also said it to reassure you. When you put it that way, I do believe you. And now, you must believe me too, when I reveal my innermost thoughts to you. Go on. But you mustn't make your usual retort about fancy and imagination. You seem to have reason to fear I may. I don't fear anything. But I know you and your skepticism. But you mustn't tell anybody about this. Promise me that. I promise. Well, you've got to take in, terrible though it is that I have some proof that Maurice is guilty. Or at least reasonable grounds for suspicion. What are you saying? Listen, then you can be the judge. When Maurice left me in the bois, he said he was going to see Marion alone, while the mother was out. But now, afterwards, it has come out that he didn't meet the mother. So he was lying to me. That's possible. And probably from the best of motives, but how can anyone conclude from that that he committed murder? Can't you see? Don't you understand? Not in the least, because you don't want to. Well, then I have no choice but to inform on him. And then we will see if he can establish an alibi. Henrietta, let me tell you the whole grim truth. You and he are both on the brink of madness. You are in the grip of the demons of suspicion and each of you is tearing the other to pieces with your sense of partial guilt. Let me see if my guess is right. Doesn't he also suspect you of murdering his child? Yes, he's as insane as that. You call his suspicions insane, but not your own? Prove the contrary, or that I suspect him unjustly. Yes, that is easily done. A further autopsy has proved that Marion died of a recognized disease, with a strange name I can't now remember. Is that true? The official report is in today's paper. You can't go by that. It may have been falsified. Henrietta! Take care, you may go over the edge without realizing it. Above all, beware of making accusations which might land you in prison. Beware! He puts his hand on her head. Do you hate Maurice? Beyond all bounds. Her love turns to hatred. The love was already tainted. Henrietta, more calmly. What shall I do? Tell me, you who alone understand me. But you don't want any sermons? Have you nothing else to offer me? Nothing. But they have helped me. Preach away, then. Try to turn your hatred against yourself. Lance your own boil. 
because that is the seat of your evil. Explain yourself. First, break with Maurice, so you haven't a chance to cultivate your consciences together. Put an end to your artistic career for which your only vocation was a desire for the gay bohemian life, as they call it. You see now how gay it is. Go home to your mother. Never. Somewhere else, then. Adolf, I presume you know I have guessed your secret and realized why you wouldn't accept that award? I suppose you understood that half-hinted story? Well, yes. But what did you do to gain peace? As I intimated, I grew conscious of my guilt, repented, resolved to atone and live the life as a penitent. How can you repent when, like me, you haven't any conscience? Is repentance a grace one gets like faith? Everything is grace. But one doesn't get it, you know, unless one seeks for it. Seek. Henrietta is silent. And don't let the time go by. If you do, you may harden and go to pieces among those past helping. Henrietta, after a further silence. Is conscience fear of punishment? No. It is the hatred of our better natures for the misdeeds of our lower natures. In that case, I have a conscience, too. Of course you have. Tell me, Adolf. Are you what one means by religious? Not in the least. It's also extraordinary. Whatever is religion? I just don't know. And I don't believe anyone can tell you. It seems to me sometimes that it's a punishment. Because no one gets religion who hasn't a bad conscience. Yes. It is a punishment. Now I know what I must do. Goodbye, Adolf. Are you going away? Yes. I am going away. To where you said Goodbye, my friend. Goodbye, Madame Catherine. Would you like me to come with you? That wouldn't do. I must go alone, as alone as I came in here one spring day, here where I didn't belong, believing that there was something called freedom, which doesn't exist. Goodbye. Exit Henrietta. Madame Catherine. I hope that lady never comes back. And I wish she had never come here at all. Adolf. Who knows if she had not some mission to fulfill here. And in any case, she deserves pity. Boundless pity. I don't deny that. For we all deserve it. She actually has done less wrong than the rest of us. Possible. But not probable. You are always hard, Madame Catherine. Tell me something. Haven't you ever done anything wrong? Madame Catherine, startled. Certainly. For I am a sinful human being. But anyone who has fallen through thin ice has the right and duty to tell others not to go that way. And without being considered hard or uncharitable. Didn't I say to Monsieur Maurice when the same lady came in here, Take care. Don't go there. But he went and so he fell in. Like a naughty self-willed child. And whoever behaves that way gets a thrashing like a disobedient boy. Adolf. Well, hasn't he had his thrashing? Yes. But it doesn't seem to have been enough but he's still going around pitying himself. That is a very popular interpretation of this complicated matter. Bosh! You do nothing but philosophize about your vices. And while you're at it, the police come and solves a little. Now leave me in peace to do my accounts. Adolf. Here is Maurice. Yes. God bless him. Maurice enters, very flushed, and sits down beside Adolf. Maurice. Good evening. Madame Catherine nods and goes on, adding, Adolf, how are things with you? Maurice, well, beginning to straighten out now. Adolf hands him a newspaper, which he does not take. So you've seen the paper? No, I don't. I don't read the papers anymore. There's nothing in them but infamy. Well, but you'd better read this one before. No, I won't. It's only lies. But now you shall hear a new view. Have you guessed who committed the murder? No one. Do you know what Henrietta was doing that quarter of an hour when the child was alone? Well, she was there. 
and it was she who did it. You are crazy, man, not I. But Henrietta is crazy, for she suspects me and has threatened to inform on me. Henrietta was just here now and used the same words as you. For it has now been established by a second autopsy that the child died from a recognized disease, the name of which escapes me. That's not true. That's what she said, too. But the official report is there in the newspaper. Official report. Then it's been falsified. She said that, too. You have the same mental sickness, the two of you. But I managed to make her see her lunacy. Where has she gone? She has gone far away. To begin a new life. (laughs) Did you go to the funeral? Yes, I was there. Well. Well, Jean was calm and had no word to say about you. She is a good woman. Why did you throw her over? I was crazy. Quite beyond myself, and then we drank champagne. Do you understand now why she cried when you drank champagne? Yes, I understand now. And because I do, I have already written and asked her to forgive me. Do you think she will forgive me? I am sure she will. She hasn't in her to hate anyone. Maurice, do you think she will really forgive? So that she will want to come back to me? I don't know about that. You have given such proof of your infidelity that she can hardly trust her fate to you any longer. Maurice, Yes, but I can feel that her affection for me has not gone. I know she will come back. How do you know that? What makes you believe it? Didn't you suspect her and that decent brother of hers of revenging themselves by setting the police on Henrietta as a prostitute? Maurice, I don't think that any longer. Although Emile is a a queer customer. Madame Catherine, now look here. What are you saying about Monsieur Emile? Of course, he is only a working man, but if only everyone was correct as he is. There is no flaw in him, and he is understanding and tact. Enter Emile. Emile. Monsieur Gerard. Maurice. Here I am. I have something private to say to you. Please say it. We are all friends here. The Abba enters and seats himself. Emile glances at him. Emile. Perhaps, after all... It makes no difference. The Abba is a friend, too, although he and I hold different opinions. You know who I am, Monsieur Gerard. My sister has only asked me to give you this package as an answer to your letter. Maurice takes the package and opens it. Now I only have to add, as I am, as it were, my sister's guardian, that on her behalf and on my own, I acknowledge you, Monsieur Gerard. Free of all obligations, now that the natural bond between you no longer exists. Maurice, but you must have a grudge against me. I don't see why. On the other hand, I should like to have a declaration from you, Monsieur Gerard, here in the presence of your friends, that you don't think me or my sister so low that we could have put police on Mademoiselle Henrietta. Maurice, I wish to take back what I said and offer you my apologies, if you will accept them. They are accepted. I wish you all a good evening. All. Good evening. Exit Emile. The tie and the gloves which Jean gave me for the opening night of my play. And which I let Henrietta throw into the fireplace. Who snatched them back? Everything is dug up. Everything repeats itself. When she gave them to me in the cemetery, she said I was to look fine and handsome, so that the others would like me too. She stayed at home herself. This hurt her too deeply, and well it might. I should not be in the company of decent people. Oh, have I done this? Scoffed at a gift from a kind heart, scorned a sacrifice to my own good. This I threw away for a laurel wreath, which is lying on the rubbish heap, and a bus which should stand in the pillory. <laughs> Monsieur Labbe, now I put myself in your hands. Say the word I need. Abbe, do you mean me to contradict your self-accusations, and inform you that you have done nothing wrong, 
Say the right word. With your permission, then, I must say that I have found your behavior as abominable as you have found it yourself. What shall I do? What shall I do to get free of all this? You know as well as I do. No. I only know that I am lost, that my life has ruined, my career closed, my reputation, and the world lost forever. And so you are looking for a new existence in another, better world, in which you are beginning to believe? That is so. You've been living for the flesh, and now you wish to live for the spirit. Are you sure, then, that this world no longer holds any attractions for you? None. Honor and illusion. Gold. Dry leaves. Women. Intoxications. Let me hide behind your consecrated walls and forget this appalling dream, which has taken two days and lasted two eternities. Abe. Very well. But this is not the place to go into the matter more closely. Let us arrange to meet in Saint-Germain this evening at nine o'clock. I am going, as it happens, to preach in the penitentiaries of Saint-Lazare, and that can be your first step on the hard road of penance. Penance? Yes. Do you not wish? Yes. Yes. Abba. After that we will have a vigil from midnight until two o'clock. That will be good. Give me your hand, so that you will not look back. Maurice, rising, and giving him his hand. Here is my hand with all my heart. The serving girl enters from the kitchen. Girl. There's a telephone call from Monsieur Maurice. Who from? From the theater. Maurice tries to break away from the Abba, but he holds him fast. Abba, to the girl. Ask what it is about. Girl. Well, they want to know if Monsieur Maurice will be at the performance tonight. Abba, to Maurice, who is still trying to get free. No, I will not let go. Maurice, to the girl. What performance is it? Adolf, why don't you read the paper? Madame Catherine and Abba. He hasn't read the paper. Maurice, it's all lies and slander. To the girl. Tell them at the theater that I am engaged tonight. I'm going to church. The girl goes out to the kitchen. Adolf, as you won't read the paper, I'd better tell you that the theater is putting on your play again, now that you are exonerated. And your literary friends have arranged to pay a tribute to you tonight, on the stage with the curtain up. A tribute to your uncontested talent. Maurice. It's not true. All. It is true. Maurice, after a silence. I don't deserve this. Abba. Good. Adolf. And there's more still, Maurice. Maurice, hiding his face with his hands. More? Madame Catherine. A hundred thousand francs. You see how they have come back to you? And the villa outside the city. Everything is coming back except Mademoiselle Henrietta. Abba, smiling. You should take it all a little more seriously, Madame Catherine. Madame Catherine. No, but you see, I can't. I can't keep serious any longer. She puts her handkerchief up to her face and bursts out laughing. Adolf. Well, Maurice. It's eight o'clock at the theater. Abba. But it's nine o'clock at the church. Adolf, Maurice, Monsieur Maurice, we must hear the end now. Maurice puts his head in his arms on the table. Adolf, free him, Monsieur Labbe. Abba, it is not for me to set free or to bind. He must do that himself. Maurice, rising. Very well. I shall go with the Abba. Abba, no, my young friend. I have nothing to give you. Nothing but a scolding which you can give yourself. And you have a responsibility to yourself and your good reputation. That you have come through this so quickly is to me a sign that you suffered your punishment as intensely as if it had lasted an eternity. And when Providence has granted you absolution, there was nothing for me to add. Why was I punished so severely when I am guiltless? Severely? Only two days. And guiltless you are not, for we are responsible for our thoughts our words and our desires. You murdered in your mind when you wished the life out of your child. Maurice, you are right. But my decision is made. Tonight I will meet you at the church and have a reckoning with myself about all this. But tomorrow I shall go to the theater. A good solution, Monsieur Maurice. Yes, that's the solution. Whew. Abba, yes, that's it. Curtain.
And that is the end of Strindberg's Crime and Crime, a comedy in four acts, written in 1899. I find it funny how, like, even though it's labeled as a comedy, this is very tragic in nature, and or at least very somber in nature. And not so much in the way of, like, his other plays, like Miss Julie or The Father or anything like that, where it's much more somber and thinking about things philosophically but this one's more just kind of like oh let's put a tragic situation in a comedic setting and so even though it's supposed to be a comedy it's still rather tragic in its construction and maybe that was just Strindberg as a person but who knows anyways I hope you liked it I hope you consider following me on every other platform that I'm currently on I want to bring special attention to my Patreon today And like PBS, I would like to say I am sponsored by viewers like you. So if you could hit bell notifications, if you could follow me or support me on Patreon, I think that's the right way of saying it. Um, I'd very much appreciate it. Um, I only have a few more episodes to record for this season, and I'm very happy about it. So please consider helping out in any way you possibly can, because I love doing this, and I, I want to know that you guys love it too, so... As always, you can suggest plays for me to read or send in your own plays uh, to bemuseartsinc at gmail.com. That's B-E-M-U-S-E-A-R-T-S-I-N-C at gmail.com. And I hope you have a lovely rest of your day. And I hope to have you back in Brendan Moyer's Playwright Corner. Thank you.